and you're looking just as beautiful and fresh as ever. <laughs> Likewise. So, a little while back, I went up to Birmingham for the launch of the Songwriting Studies Research Network. And while I was there, I met up with the lead investigator who's going to guide us through the day. And he also happens to be an old mate of mine. So, Dr. Simon Barber, uh, academic, songwriter, presenter of Soda Jerker, the very popular Soda Jerker podcast. That's right. And now founder of the Songwriting Research Network. Yeah. Am I right in Songwriting saying that? Studies Research Songwriting Network. Studies Research Network, which has been launched today here at the Ben Conservatoire. Um, how do you feel? How's it gone? What is the network and how has today been for you? Well, the network is an initiative to get people together who have a shared interest in songwriting, but they might exist in other kinds of fields. They might be practitioners, they might be industry members, they might be um, academics, and, they, and within that they might be looking at, you know, things that you wouldn't normally associate with songwriting per se, so they could be music therapists, or they could be interested in the study of history and institutions and organisations, but if they're focusing on uh, the music industries, they might well be looking at a company like Motown or, mm. um, you know, publishing or the history of uh, Tim Pan Alley or the Brill Building or something mm. like that. So all of these people in some way are connected to songwriting. Mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to do is create an interdisciplinary field of songwriting studies where there's actually space for those people to explore ideas about songs. What are songs? What do they mean? Where do they come from? Mm -hmm. How do people write? How do people exploit songs, expose songs? Mm. Um, and so today was the first event, the launch event, of getting some of these people under the same roof mm -hmm. and trying to find some common ground, and it's gone really well. So who have we had today? We had a, a sort of range of, uh, we had a keynote speaker, didn't we, from Philip McIntyre and then... Yep, uh, so Philip McIntyre from the University of Newcastle, Australia, came over to speak at our event and he talked about creativity and how novel things are made. That's really his area of research around innovation. Okay, so I'm just gonna jump right back in here because this was a very interesting part of the day and I wanna explore this a little bit more. So, Professor McIntyre uses a systems approach to creative songwriting, or to thinking about that. Um, for this, he draws on people like Bourdieu, Chick Sentmaheim, recent work in psychology, um, but also Kerrigan's model, which is right there. What's going on here is that you've got the interaction of these three different elements. There's the agent, that is you as an individual, or perhaps a collaborative group, getting to know a domain of knowledge, that is, for example, a style of songwriting and uh, doing this within a particular field, that is to say a community, a social group, an, an institution that understands and interacts with that domain of knowledge. Um, so it's the interplay of these three things that set the conditions for creative songwriting to occur. It's kind of like you think about you need oxygen, uh, fuel and heat to create fire. Um, and I like this, that, um, this sort of way of thinking about songwriting because it's very ethnomusicological, which is my particular disciplinary background. Um, it emphasises the, uh, the highly contextual nature of cultural practices uh, and the fact that artistic meaning is socially cited. And also ex it explodes the, uh, the popular myth that some artistic genius just comes up with inspiration out of the blue and it's just the talent, pure talent, that does that. Actually, what's really going on is a system of things interacting. So that's really interesting. Anyway, back to Simon. Um, we also had a panel featuring um, some people who work in industry but uh, are mainly songwriters and practitioners. So we have Mary Spender, who's a very successful YouTuber, songwriter, guitarist. I have a lot of friends in the YouTube community. Of, like you'll, You won't know any of their names, but they have massive audiences and they're earning so much money from something that they just think up in their head, they make a video about it. And it just allows them the freedom to remain independent, produce their own music, and they have a ready-made audience there and then. So there we go, that's my YouTube rant. <laughs> we had Kieran McIntosh, who's a producer who's worked with the likes of Loma Faith, Emily Sanday, mm -hmm. um, all kinds of people and he's writing songs for them, producing. You know, trying to be a songwriter, artist, singer, songwriter, whatever you consider yourself, um, is find, continuously finding mentors, finding people that have got the knowledge and the information. Um, the knowledge is, is, the, is like, that's paramount. You need the information. 
Uh, you can be really skillful, but without the knowledge of how to get it to places, um, you're going to really struggle. And I think that's probably one way, one area that I've succeeded in. Also, we had Pete Astor, who's an academic mm -hmm. at Westminster, but he's also had a, a long and quite illustrious career as an indie singer-songwriter right. on various labels and with lots of different acts. Mm -hmm. The place I come from is like guitar and voice, but I mean, for a long time I did make electronic stuff, and I've also just recently been writing songs that are very much collaborative, where you know, it'll be, what's, what's the track and hook thing? I mean, it won't be like track and hook, but we'll, we'll make something with a drum machine and a whole set of stuff, and then maybe I'll make up some words which kind of don't make any sense, and then kind of evolve in that way. So I'm, I'm very aware of those different kinds of songwriting practice. Okay, so I'm just gonna jump in again here and mention the other great panel of the day, uh, which was in the morning, and it featured David Meir, Joe Connington Scott, Andy West, Kesia Ellis, Richard Parfit and my mate Polly Paulsma. And in particular, I really loved uh, what Joe Collinson Scott said about collaborative songwriting as a research tool. The, the point she made was that um, if you sit down and interview someone about a topic, you'll get a certain kind of answer. That's great. Um, but if you sit down and write a song with someone about that topic, you'll get a different kind of answer uh, and perhaps unique insights uh, into how they think and feel about that topic. So a uh, really interesting point and she's used this uh, as a research tool working with uh, people in the criminal justice system, so people in prison, people coming out of prison um, and etc. And also uh, working with musicians dealing with environmental issues and questions around sustainability and touring and whatnot um, and also music and mental health. So super interesting stuff. Um, okay so now with all those perspectives in mind Let's go back to Simon. And from those perspectives, you can really get a sense of the rich history of mm. songwriting, of its importance to these people in their daily practice, mm. of the way they think about and theorise mm. songwriting, yeah. all kinds of things. Yeah, and of course the podcast as well. Yeah, so we did a live episode of the Soda Jerky podcast with Katie yeah. Tunstall. She Brilliant. came in and talked to us about her process and played us a few examples on stage yeah. as well of things that she's been releasing over the years and also new things that she, you know, just sort of started to develop. So that was quite thrilling to hear. Yeah. One of the most um, annoying things for me is when people come to a gig and say, I like your records, but your gig's amazing. And I'll go, shit, how do I get my gig on records? And it's really hard to capture that, that energy, but get that lightning in a bottle on an album. And I feel like I got the closest I've ever got to it with this recent one of mine. Strips of light to light from either side of my soul thinking why you hide it with a colourful smile. So much more kind of fancy, um, yeah, just much more poetic. Um, and I don't think any of us, he, he said he thinks he knew that it was going to be big, but I don't think anyone thought that I to the Telescope was going to do what it did. I was a 29-year-old folk singer from Scotland. Do you know what I mean? It was not, it didn't look good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's quite hard too when you've had a song that does that, you're just like, oh, first two bars, what's the first two bars going to be? You've got to let it go. <laughs> Great stuff. And then moving forward, there's a few more of these events planned. What are your hopes for those and, and what's the plan? Yeah, so it was funded for two years. So we've mm -hmm. got four events in the pipeline, including right. this one. The next one will be in London in September mm -hmm. and that will be focused more on industry. Mm -hmm. So we'll probably get more into the weeds in terms of streaming, copyright, uh -huh. publishing, those sorts of issues yeah. on the second event. Cool. The third event, uh, which will be based in Liverpool, they're the partner in this uh -huh. endeavour. Mike Jones of the University of Liverpool is the co-investigator. Uh -huh. And that event is going to be more around the sort of mediation of songwriting, how we've come to understand it through mm. the lens of, say, history, media, film, mm. right. these sorts of things. Interesting. 
Um, and the final event will be more about education and environment, mm -hmm. so getting into pedagogy yeah. and, and also things that you might not necessarily expect but are connected to the way that songwriting is used in a social context. Mm -hmm. So protest songs or mm -hmm. therapy, using mm -hmm. as a tool for social change, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Right, or language revitalisation. Exactly, fact. so you're <laughs> going to be a big figure in that last event. <laughs> well, I don't know, I'll, I'll be happy to uh, contribute in whatever way. So, well, thank you so much, that's really appreciated. I think loads of really interesting stuff to think about. So, and it's been, I've had such a great day. So, and mate, it's great to see you again yep. after quite a little while. Yeah, so. it's been, what, 20 years? since we used to play ridiculous. together at university it's, yeah it's certainly so. a while yeah i think it is pretty much that's it's but here we are and you're looking just as beautiful and fresh as ever <laughs> likewise <laughs> excellent thank you cheers man feel the bromance um yeah so there you go that's about sums up the day and a few of my thoughts on it um had a great time i met some lovely brilliant people and i'm sure loads of amazing things will come out of this new network uh, of course, I'll keep you posted on my involvement that might happen. I'm certainly hoping to contribute and attend future events. Uh, so, yeah, if you've enjoyed this video, of course, please do like and subscribe. And I hope to see you soon.